There we go. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along um, to today's webinar, which is disease in salad crops, how to save losses. Um, before we get going, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, firstly, to remind you that this session is being recorded to go on the Knowledge Hub section of the Tevi Kemri website. Um, so if you prefer to keep the camera off, please do so. Um, but if you've got any issues in being recorded, please let me know um, and we can edit you out. Um, so this is an interactive session. Um, please feel free to ask questions either verbally or in the chat. Um, but while others are talking, if you could keep yourselves on mute to avoid any trouble with interference. Um, leading this afternoon's webinar is Erica Wedgwood of ADAS and joining her is Sophie from Cardiff Salads. Um, I'll pass over to you guys to introduce yourselves. Okay, uh, I'm Erica Wedgwood, as just been said, a plant pathologist based near Cambridge. Um, been working as a plant pathologist now, I don't know, probably about 40 years. Uh, mainly on um, sort of non-cereal crops. So starting off at uh, the National Institute of Agricultural Botany doing variety testing um, on, on vegetables and um, grasses, peas, beans, Aussie drape, and then moved to ADAS and been working on more vegetables, uh, protected crops, protected edibles and fruit, soft fruit and a bit of top fruit and even a bit of Christmas trees. So whatever sort of needs my attention, really, I'll I'll do it. So uh, and a lot of the diseases, you can sort of um, use the information across from one to the other. So uh, I've always, always got something on the go. Um, my name is Sophie and I'm from Cardiff Salad Garden. We're in the centre of one of the parks in central Cardiff. We have a polytunnel and a glass house. They're both about 15 metres by five metres in size. And um, we've been running there. We, we just grow leafy greens. So we're, we're just growing all kinds of leafy salad leaves. Um, and we've been doing that for about five years. Prior to that, I was running a five acre veg box scheme. And prior to that, I was working on someone else's organic small holding for about seven years. Okay, we're seeing we've just got two, well, apparently two growers, Chris and Emma. Would you like to say what you're, what you're doing, Chris, perhaps first? Yeah, sure. Um, we're, we're based in Wrexham. Um, we've been growing lattice, watercress, pea shoots, edible flowers, hydroponically and polytunnels. Um, this is our 10th year now. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's us in a nutshell, really, other than other bits and bobs. But <laughs> Emma? Hi. Hello. Hi, sorry, I can't get my video to come on. That's all right, we've got a um, picture of you. <laughs> I think our internet's a bit bad at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm in Mid Wales. I've got a market garden, um, which I run with my husband. Um, but um, staff that grow the veg now, I, I concentrate on the flowers. Um, we do fruit and nuts as well. And I teach horticulture. Um, been doing that for about 30 years. So, uh, yeah, we just struggle with weather here in Mid Wales. Yeah. Cold and wet. Mm. Well, we've got too dry over here, so <laughs> somewhere in the middle, it must be about right. <laughs> okay, then. Um, so I'm going to share my screen in a minute, but I mean, I've I've targeted this talk. It was quite hard to know who I was, who was going to come on the call. So some of it, it sounds like both of you know a fair bit anyway. So some of it, you may want to go off and make a cup of tea or something rather. Um, but um, I've just been talking with Sophie and, and we agreed that some of the things that are quite um, sort of basic, it's, it's worth remembering and knowing that, that that is the sort of the point where you can make make such a big difference, really. So I'll see if I can work this uh, share screen thing. We never know nowadays with these, uh, these sort of things. Let's see. I'm trying to get the slideshow up. I think that's it, okay. So uh, this uh, talk is about disease management for leafy salads, but to be honest, I had to I've had to just really concentrate on lettuce. If if there's other crops that you you perhaps like to talk about, then um, we can see um, what if you've got particular problems. Perhaps we can discuss those as uh, at the end or wherever it uh, fits in. 
Okay, so let's start off. So I'm starting off, I don't know if that doesn't fit quite well, um, but looking at integrated um, pest management. So you, you all know this, I'm sure. It's integrated pest disease and weed management, but it's always abbreviated to IPM. And this is quite a nice um, uh, disease uh, cycle of uh, a continual improvement of IPM, which I, I've swiped off the Australian government and I hope they don't mind, but it's just so just wanted to say what well, I, I could have written it, rewritten it all and it being a bit silly. So I've I've borrowed it. And there is the link there. I would, you know, if you fancy a bedtime reading, get into that website and um, have a look what's on it. So looking at this one to five model, um, there's obviously understanding about the disease. There's thinking about what you can do to prevent it coming in and monitoring and then decision making. And then number five, looking back to see what you've what you've done. I'm going to start off with the number two, as you can see, I've ringed, particularly looking at uh, site selection and um, crop rotation, cultural practices. As I said, this is some of it is going to be a little bit basic. Uh, and then the sort of more like second half, I'll be looking at the individual um, pathogens and diseases and specific measures that relate to those. So the first thing is sort of starting to grow is where you um, need to where you need to um, want to grow your plants. So, as you know, so a plant is like you, a good environment, keeping fit, balanced food, low stress and nurturing makes you more resilient to disease infections. So it's where you put your plants and how you look after them can affect how they um, survive and how they fight their way off and out of any disease or pest problems. So. I think we've answered these questions now. I think we've got one um, hydroponics. Um, Emma, were you? I don't know if you'll perhaps you can ask. We uh, can. I think you're still able to talk. But um, do you, do you also grow in soil, soil? Both of you as well. Yeah, soil based. Okay. Me. No, no. So Chris, you were just you were hydroponics and soil, was it? No, I'm just purely hydroponics so okay, and FT. Right then. Okay. Well, I haven't got hydroponics on my suggestions, <laughs> but we can work. There's some things, obviously, that uh, um, because soil is in water, that the disease is a, a, a match as well. And I presume the hydroponics is all indoors. Um, Emma, are you outside uh, when you can be? Uh, we grow salad mainly indoors during the winter and outside during the summer. Okay. Yeah. All right then. Um, so have you got um, tunnels or glass houses? Have you got just basic glass houses or have you got controlled ones? Uh, the glass houses I just use for propagation. I don't really grow many crops in there. For, um, so it's polytunnel, I grow in the polytunnel. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's automated irrigation. Um, yeah, pretty basic. Okay. All right, so it's nice to sort of know what, what sort of setup we're thinking at. So what I'm going to actually talk about, I think uh, one, you have to go to sleep, those are hydroponics, but um, I'm going to talk a bit about the soil um, and the problems and the, the benefits of growing in soil. And uh, we'll just go through those. So if you were thinking of uh, where you're going to start up growing, you need to decide soil or substrates or hydroponics. Um, the soil problem with the soil is that you can harbour pathogens but you can also um, there's situations where we found that substrates you know bags of peat or coir are left outside and they can also become infested with um, pathogens and pests so you, you, you don't always um, have a clean compost. Um, trouble with soil is you do need to prepare it um, and you need to nurture your earthworms and, and microbes. Uh, with substrates you've got to uh, but buy the pots and things you've got to disinfect if you're reusing and it's especially important that you use clean uh, um, propagation um, containers for uh, so that you don't get disease because the, the old mantra is start clean um, stay clean and I think this is a very important bit that propagation areas should be you know almost like operating theatres um, so that you're not introducing diseases um, so then outdoors fire protected. So the rainfall, you're certainly in Wales, you're going to get it free, but you've got all the problems with the, the as you know, the weather. Um, indoors, you've got the harvesting is going to be easier because you can get out there whenever you want. 
um, but you can get a problem with the the covers although they can stop things like animals getting in big animals um, they also they're a nice place for pests and diseases to overwinter and they do need proper cleaning out proper um, pressure washing um, so that the diseases aren't aren't lurking in the in the crevices uh, and again the problem with uh, particularly polytunnels is they do build up humidity and then most of the diseases like um, a humidity can humidity so the spores can germinate so that is is a problem um, if you have sort of posh glass houses you can have uh, ventilation that works you know what set up to a, a a probe that monitors the humidity and it can open the vents but that's probably a, a, on somebody's wish list for for most people so for the soil health um i think you know most of you again i can sort of can say most you know but anyway you need to avoid compaction so that the they got a good open structure in the soil and that allows not only the plants to push through but also the microbes um, they like aerobic conditions if you have um cl cloggy conditions you get that sulfury smell which shows you that they've got the wrong microbes in there and that can then suffer the plants can suffer um if you're going out um particularly if in wales it's often wet you know you know you have to do that sort of thing with you you make a, a clay thing with a, like an earthworm a little sausage and if you can do that you shouldn't be going out into the soil it should be uh dry to be able to get out there or nearly dry but you do need to make sure you've got organic matter in your soil uh, because that increases water holding and then there's, there's food for the earthworms. Um, if you bring in manures, um, it's important that you have them to a certain standard. So there's PASS 100 um, and PASS 110 for composts and digestate. Um, so th that means that they've been um, kept to a certain temperature, usually over 70 degrees C because it's very easy for pathogens to survive even at quite extreme, what you'd call, because of quite extreme temperatures. So 50 degrees C, the pathogens won't, won't necessarily be bothered. So you've got to be careful where you get your, your um, organic matter from, because they can uh, just bring in a soil-borne pathogens into the field. And in the latter half of this talk, I will be saying some of the things that uh, particularly are carried in the, in the soil. The other thing you can do with soil is there's a big sort of fashion now for cover crops, things like phacelia, buckwheat, vetch, rye, and they're quite good because certainly like that mix have all got different rooting structures, rooting depths, and that can make the soil nice uh, so the roots can get down. And also it saves having a bare ground and the weeds can be suppressed. Um, the other sort of current trend is for minimal zero tillage, which is OK if you've already got a good soil structure because it will preserve that. Um, but if you've got a compacted soil, then it's clearly going to need to be um, improved before you can do that. And then you've got the issues of how do you control weeds rather than um, um, plowing them in. Uh, so that would have to be a herbicide or maybe flaming. Um, and then if you don't cultivate, you've got the disease material left on the surface. And you'll be hearing later about the different types of um, resting spores. So some of them, it may be best um that they aren't actually incorporated because they can survive for about 10 years if you do incorporate them in uh, so if you have got diseases you you do need to be aware what you've got and what their chances of surviving if you either leave it on the surface or plow it in so um i don't know if anybody's got any particular problems they've had with um with those that grow in soil with soil health improvement um do you sort of put organic matter in the soil regularly? The main problem I have on the scale we're at is getting enough organic matter. Mm. Um, yeah, you, we used to be able to get organic muck easily, but um, the farmers hold on to it now because the price of uh, fertilizer has gone up. Mm. So it's harder to get hold of. And because we live in the middle of nowhere, um, we only get wood chip every couple of years when there's someone working up the valley. Um, so that's been our biggest problem. And we're miles and miles of municipal green waste. Mm. So the transport of that's very expensive. But um, I've mainly been using grass cuttings as a green mulch, yeah. and I've had fantastic results with that. Um, so we, 
we have lovely cut lawns all around <laughs> it, our, our beds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that that um, I have done some work with green compost, and you do need to be careful of your source for that because some of them don't really um, clear out all the plastics. And you can I've been into a field where you get like toothbrushes and things on it, so um, it certainly um, pays to go and inspect what they're actually giving you anyway. If you if you do go and do get green green compost, um, even if they have got the pass certificate, it allows allows bits and pieces through that that aren't uh, you know, as long as they're heated, then that's that's supposed to be okay. Um, so I think, Chris, why did you go to hydroponics? Is it is it was it sort of um, health problems or with, with the crops? Um, no, we live on top of a quarry, so we haven't really got much soil to oh, play right. with, and um, <laughs> lead levels of lead are huge in our soil. We've got all right, lead okay. mines and stuff, um, but we we. We'd seen a hydroponic system, pretty much copied it. There was another guy um, in Anglesey doing it at the time. We just really liked the sort of the cleanliness of it and the, the simplicity of it. And, and I particularly, I'm not particularly green fingered. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of, yeah, it's, it's quite forgiving, really. So. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of just the, the production yields and so on from sort of per square meter of it. Sort of, yeah, that's what's all it was really. Okay. All right. So um, I'll go on to the next next bit, and we'll see we're talking about uh, soil microbes. So I mean, this will be similar. To, I mean, with your Chris, with your uh, hydroponics, is it sort of um, do you recirculate it, or do you have it sort of sterilise it in between? It's it's recirculated, yes. Um, but sort of we crop every sort of six weeks, and and every time we crop, it's it's cleared out and cleared out and disinfected and, and replanted yeah. um so yeah it's it's it is recirculated water but it is yeah. disinfected every every mm. just every month really it's sort of a yeah i think it's sort of in a way it's it's it is that disinfection at the beginning that's important to make sure that you haven't got anything that's that's crept in from something else um and and you know usually we say you know don't uh, recycle water without treating it but you'd, you'd be you couldn't you couldn't do that because you'd be you know forever treating the, the quite large volumes of water i assume um but in the, yeah, in the, the soil the, the, the got... water itself doesn't tend to be a problem because of the, the nutrients that we add into it have quite a lot of salts and so on and oh, it right, kind yeah. of sort of looks yeah. after itself on that point really yeah. um yeah. but yeah um humidity within the polytunnels is is our biggest challenge i think and okay. aphids and mildew <laughs> all right <laughs> Or we'll find out a bit more about those in a, in a while. Um, so anyway, for for Emma, who who does grow in the bit in the soil, um, she will be having you know free living bacteria and, and fungi and mycorrhizal fungi that are, that are good microbes. So um, use, they utilise the root exudates and feed on the plant debris, and then they break down mineral sources to release nutrients. So they've got nitrate and phosphate, which otherwise would be not so much available for plant uptake. So um, obviously hydroponics you're supplying all the all the elements ready ready for the plants but if it's soil they're, they're having to um, you know rely on the microbes to, to help them you can buy microbial supplement products um, some of them are marketed as biostimulants and they're suggested to do all sorts of wonderful things for your plants as well as um, add the microbes um, there's things like compost teas which may replenish the rhizosphere but I think there's now we can have molecular, we're doing a lot more molecular work. We're finding out what actually lives in the soil. I mean, it's been very hard before to actually try and work out what is actually in the soil. So we're really at the beginning of a learning learning stage of what actually, you know, what are the actual components of the rhizosphere population that is good? And are there particular types that need to be there? And we're, we're, we're learning, we don't know yet. So, but generally I think in, in, in nature as, as a whole, Sort of more diverse is usually better uh, and i think probably going on that the more you can allow things to develop the better um you can also buy microbial bioprotectants biofungicides now these are these are be registered with the hse um, as being eff efficacious against uh, fungi and oomycetes which are things like the um, pythiums and phytophoras so you've got pre-stop and trianum which are uh, fungal uh, bio, biofungicides and then the bacteria 
are in the uh, things like AMLOX, Serenade ISO, and Integral Pro. And they um, they're alive in the in the in the product, and they we put them onto the plant, and then they compete with the pathogens for the food that's um, the end you know the exudates off the plant in the roots, or the leaf um, material. Um, they don't actually damage the leaf; they just feed on the the microbes that are there, and uh, also they can use enzymes to digest um, the 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 nasty bacteria and fungi that are in that they're being used against. Um, but they are more specialist and they do require good conditions for growth because they don't really want to be put out in the sun in the UV or left in a, in a very hot place. They need, um, in a way, similar conditions to the, the, the pathogens. So they're not perhaps as easy as, as chemical products to, to work with. I put this, um, so I don't know what you call it, a sort of a pie chart up. I don't... I'm not really intending you to read it, but um, there's actually a, a web link down the bottom there. Um, and I believe you're going to be given some of these uh, web links so you can actually um, click on them. Um, but it's showing that so there, there is a lot of research on microbial products and how they, they work, various um, chemical, chemical pathways um, that, that help them to provide resistance that can be stimulated by microbial products. And so some of it is a bit sort of um, uh, circumspect, but there is now increasing evidence for for some products actually having a real a real um, effect on the on the plant sort of makeup and how they they signal signal um, signal um, between the leaves and from the roots when there is stress. So it's it's worth a, a read if you if you've got time. Um, so I don't know if any either of you have used sort of bioprotectants there um you know fungicides or there's a lot of push in the in the commercial press for biostimulants have either of you um used any of those i think they use a, a fungicide and so on but um yeah the bioprotectants and biostimulants are, yeah might be something that would work for us mm. so i think it would probably it should, you say you've got problems with um or you can have things with humidity so if you were going to put them on, you know, if you've got, um, I don't know, uh, botrytis, say, or something, whether pre-stop can act against botrytis. So that might sort of be some sort of product that you could use. And the, there's a very, um, I think it's a one day harvest interval. So that's one of the issues with using chemical controls that you have to wait several days before you can harvest, whereas you can you can harvest with these bioprotect bioprotectants very quickly. Um, and the biostimulants, well, I think the trouble with that is there is differences between uh, different situations where you use them. So it's it's hard to actually get the evidence for those um, working consistently. You may get them working in your situation, but somebody else using the same product might may not. Um, OK, we'll, we'll go on. I just wanted to say yeah. um, we've got another person joined us, Alison, as well. OK. Just All right. So good. You're aware, Erica. OK. Um, I think I think she left a note in the chat box. I think she's growing in soil as well. I know, Dick, oh, no okay. big. Um, right. growing, so. right. Sorry, Alison, I've been ignoring you. <laughs> um, so that's good. If somebody else is growing in soil, so we've got these soil-borne pathogens. So I've talked about the the good ones that are in there that are helping the plant to take up nutrients, but there are some bad ones, and I've said these are bad because they can survive in the soil for around five years. Um, they have resting stages, which is usually sort of thick walled spores. So there's microdokium, which I'm going to talk about uh, later, fusarium. Downy mildews also have resting spores, but there's less certainty really that they can actually then reinfect the, the plants. Um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced they do, so that's where I put the question mark. Um, then there's really nasty ones, the ugly ones, which they can stay in the soil for 10 years, and you've really got a problem if you're trying to if you've only got a small patch of ground and you're you're hoping to reuse it, certainly within the next 10 years, um, it's going to be a problem. So those things like Rhizoctonia, Sclerotinia, Pythium, and there's a, a fungal-like organism that spreads uh, uh, the the virus on the end there, the leaf, leaf big, big vein virus disease. 
So really looking at the things that you can do to minimize the chance of soilborne pathogens infecting your crops is the long rotations. And I, in the next bit, I'll show you the, some of the um, particular uh, diseases and what rotations to use. But you've got to check the host range because there's no point rotating to another crop that's actually also a host. So probably more often than not, cereals and grasses are a good bet uh, as an as a interim rotation if you can spare the time to do it. The other thing is growing in substrate or hydroponics. It's very important to make sure you don't move soil around on boots or equipment. It's probably easier said than done. I mean, you know, maybe boots are easy, but to actually scrape down big rotavators at the end of the day is a bit of a bind, but it's worth worth the effort um, doing it. Um, similarly, I've said earlier about manures, make sure they're fully composted. Um, don't bring disease into a field on transplants. And that's probably easier said than done for some diseases because they often have a latent phase. And it's only when you um, have the um, disease conditions that they actually um, can then start to show. The other thing is the strong root growth. So we said earlier about aeration and watering. And most important is if you do get diseased plants is to destroy them, to remove and burn them. Um, you can get flaming uh, equipment to burn in situ. Um, that's maybe, maybe worth thinking about rather than carting the stuff away. Um, and then um, I said earlier about the risk of incorporating post-harvest waste. There is the option of steaming. Um, there's a big sort of, you know, you could probably spend a day mulling over that. It's very expensive with the energy. Uh, you have to make sure the soil is prepared properly. You have to be able to get to the depth and to achieve the temperatures. So that can be that can be not always successful. And then there's the use of these bioprotectant drenches. So they have got to be put on before you think anything's uh, going to be happening. Um, so you know you could just be using them when you when you don't need them. So if you cover those top points, um, hopefully you shouldn't need the uh, the chemicals or the bioprotectants. Um, fungicides um, with microbes in to try and help you out. Uh, let's see, Got the next page down. Oops, I lost my my action. Yeah, okay, right. So, still thinking about the soilborne pathogens. So, we've done now um, looking at prevention and planning, and we're going to look at now on about the uh, the actual weed pests, not the weeds, the, the diseases that you're likely to encounter. So this is the first one that's uh, going to might you might encounter. I've certainly seen it in sort of garden crops. Um, it's ring spot shot hole, which is caused by a fungus called microdochium. Um, you've got the brown lesions there whose centers may drop out. Sometimes you can get sort of slug damage that looks a bit like that, but it probably wouldn't be all over spotty. It'd probably be about the up the midrib. Um, so that one is particularly at cold, cool times of year and it does need leaf wetness of at least eight hours. It's mainly you'll find it on the lower leaves because it's spread by water splash up from the soil. And if it's in the soil, it will be surviving there for over three years. So the thing to do that is obviously avoid uh, lots of leaf wetness and if you've got um, a four-year break if possible if you have got if you do get that and there are less susceptible varieties that you can um, see in the catalogues. Um, Fusarium wilt um, is and root I don't know if you can see with that thing whether it's at the top of the screen right anyway Fusarium wilt and root rot is a particular type of Fusarium oxysporum which is Fusarium a form of speciale is called Lactuki. Now there's lots of different Fusarium oxysporums and the, the word after the F, F dot SP is the host. So um, you don't need to worry about growing, I don't know, tomatoes after that one because it won't, it won't get that particular Fusarium, but um, it will uh, attack any, any lettuces. Um, the main picture there is a poor crop that's um, got this Fusarium wilt. It comes in through the, the soil and it comes into the roots and gets into the, the xylem, the water conducting vessels. If you cut the lettuce open, you get a sort of reddish brown color. Uh, and what happens is the, the microconidia that are formed by, uh, by the fungus 
they start plug plugging the um the vessels and then you start to get the wilting um of, of the crop and you it's it's permanent wilt you can't you can't change it um that is a a warm soil thing so it'd be in only indoor in soils you wouldn't well normal years you wouldn't get it outdoors um it can be by seeds as well and plants can carry it they can be symptomless for a while and then they can die um race race one is now widespread i mean it's not it's probably been around i think the first detection of this fusarium wilting lettuce was about 1955 and it's sort of um been increasing and now we've got a new race race four which seems to be more aggressive and it can still be active at lower temperatures they, they were finding it in belgium um quite recently and um it can survive on non-hosts um the other one the other race is really just uh, on lettuce so this is a bit of a more of a worry um for whatever race you've got it's going to be a minimum five-year break these resting spores we preserve are called chlamydia spores um it actually can get in without wounds on the roots, but if you have wounds, then that's going to aid entry. And there are two products, AmiloX and PreStop, that you can apply to the um, soil if you're worried about um, getting it or maybe having brought it in on plants or something. Uh, and that will sort of contain contain the spread a bit. Another one I suspect you'll probably seen is Rhizotonia bottom rot. Um, with the rise of, with the sclerotia from rhizotonia in the soil that they will then web up you see some mycelial threads here you can actually see they're like human hair um, often they are brown um, and they will they web up from the soil onto the lower leaves and cause this brown spotting around the midrib um, that is leaf wetness and again warm and that can spread the those mycelium can spread in the wind the water as well as being in the soil for three to ten years Again, it's a long break, four years, because of sclerotia. And you've got to be aware that um, this nastamosin group, one, includes things like carrot and radish. There are other groups that um, you have to look at them up um, and see which ones they are, um, which you can actually um, uh, it rotate with. If you have upright varieties, the leaves aren't on the uh, ground so much, so they're less likely to get the infection coming up onto them. So I know that play, planting on raised beds is, is therefore a good idea and avoiding over irrigation. Um, white mould is another thing um, that does tend to be in patches. So it's often, if particularly if you've had after oil seed rape and the sclerotia form in that crop and they're forming a patch and then you get the patch of it dying. They start off as like a watery soft lesion. Often I think it looks like somebody's poured a kettle over it. It's like a, a kind of a translucent lesion. And then as the tissue starts to dry, you'll get white mycelium. And then in that my mycelium, you'll get these little sclerotia, look like um, mouse droppings, sort of round mouse droppings. This is a more of a cold, cold weather one, so 13 to 18. And this is one of these ugly ones that can survive up to 10 years. So you do need a long break, um, but there are a heck of a lot of different host plant species. So finding what you can um, break with is, is different, really, is difficult. Um, you can avoid infection spreading from old crops because the, the sclerotia germinate to produce little mus mushrooms called apothecia, and then they produce airborne spores, which will um, carry in the air to, to new crops. So you can avoid um, planting certainly downwind them. There is a product called Contans WG, which you can put in the soil, and that does start to sort of digest the um, sclerotia, but you need to put it on three months before planting. And there is also amylo X is, is registered for use against uh, sclerotinia. So, um, you know, that's an option there. Um, damping off pythium, I'm sure most of you have seen that. Um, either you may have it in your seed trays or in the soil. This is actually spinach. Um, either the seedlings don't come up or they come up and they collapse over. And this is a an umai seed. So it's got um, some of them have like swimming spores. So the wetter it is, uh, the, the more likely they are to spread. There's different species. So some like it cool, some like it warmer. So, you, you, you know, you could get it any time of the year and they do spread in, spread in water and um, wind and dust. One of the things of these is they can form ooze spores, which they blow up into the air. They can cut onto glasshouse roofs or shed roofs and then you put them in your water 
if you're recirculating water using rainwater, they can be in there, they can hatch, and then um, they can then get into your crops. Um, there's a way of sort of testing for that. There are um, kit that you can use like a piece of apple in a, in a piece of um, muslin, put them in there, and then you can get a lateral flow device like we've all been using for our COVID um, testing that will test and see if you have actually got um, certainly phytophthora in the water. That's quite a common kit you can get. Um, so again, planting on raised beds, don't have a water. Um, if you have tra transplants, you won't get the problem with the seedlings damp damping off. And there are these um, uh, trenches, serenade as so an integral pro that you can use to put on your um, seed trays um, to help um, reduce the chance of pythium taking hold. Uh, virus, so we've got uh, lettuce, big vein virus. You can see from the picture there, there's vein clearing leaf sort of bubbling and stunted growth. And this is a soil-borne virus. It's spread by this, um, I put fungus, it's sort of a fungus, it's Olpidium virulentus. Um, you may have heard of Olpidium brassicae, but they've now sort of split, up, split off this one as the one that actually carries the virus. Uh, it survives 10 years in the soil, carried on seed and seedlings, but also beware that it is also on weed hosts. So if you've got South Isle chickweed, it could be on that. Um, We've got the same control measures as the other diseases, raised beds don't all over water, um, but there's no plant protection products against it. Um, I think I'll move on from, because we're running out of a bit of time here, so I'll, we'll perhaps talk about this, the, all the diseases at the end, so I'll carry on to the um, aerial diseases now. So we've got viruses carried by seeds, aphids, harbored by crops and weeds. And then we've got spores of fungi and oomycetes, the water molds that had these fl flagellate spores. And they can be carried by plants, between plants by wind, rain and irrigation. Now all of them, aphids and spores, can be carried through poor hygiene, poor biosecurity, um, physical contact with people, animals as well. You can get aphids and things carried in by birds, whatever, you know, anything that's been rubbing on things, tools, trays. Uh, so you, ideally, you do need to make sure that if you can stop people coming in from the outside into your houses, um, changing clothes, putting um, putting uh, overalls on, if, if you know, that'll at least sort of squash the aphids a bit, um, then, then do so. So some of the aerial viruses is, um, born by aphids, you can see here, could come by mosaic virus. Um, it's got you get sort of necrotic spots that is also um, on chickweed and red nettle, red dead nettle. You've got lettuce mosaic virus, as by the sound of it, it's sort of a mottling. It's also seed, but again, on can be on groundsel and south thistle, and the aphids will carry it between that and your crop. And then you've also got turnip yellows virus, which, as the name suggests, you get yellowing. Uh, it's on other crops as well, like beet and spinach, some brassicas, and the aphids will just move it between it. Once you've got viruses, there's nothing you can do about it. it it's there. Um, so really, you need to ensure weed flea planting areas. I mean, there's a lot of um, keenness now for planting flowers or allowing weeds to grow on headlands. But, you know, they are a virus residue. Uh, and also they will have aphids, which, of course, feed the birds. So it's a bit of a bit of a moot point, really. Um, you have to decide really what, what you want to what you want to do with that. Um, clearly, though, you can plant away from older crops, ideally upwind, monitor crops and control aphids. And the best thing is to pull up and take away affected plants because the aphids will then spread, less likely to spread them to the uh, clean plants nearby. Sometimes you can be fooled by nutrient deficiencies that, that can cause stunting and yellowing. So um, it probably is a good idea to either have a you know good good look or see how the the, the um like the pattern of the um, plants in the field, if they're all over the place, uh, it may be more like to be a nutritional thing and you can get tissue tested. Um, downy mildew is also carried in the air. This is probably something that you will have seen. It has these quite distinctive angular lesions, usually showing better on the underside. Sometimes they penetrate through um, to the top, um, but the sporulation is usually on the on the leaf underside. And uh, that is cool, moist conditions, and the spores do blow in the in the air. They do get splashed around as well. Um, there are lots of different pathogen races. I think 
there are now varieties or there have been for some time varieties that uh, have resistance to it and they keep bringing out new races and then combining lots of them together. Um, there are breeders lists of, of varieties that you can choose um, that have got various uh, resistance factors. One suggestion is maybe planting a mix of varieties. Um, so if you get a problem with one particular race of the pathogen, you, you may have a variety that's got a different, different resistance and may survive better. Uh, if you've got glass houses, you can get um, logger systems that warn of condensation and, and trigger the ventilation in that house. Now, this one is the one that you're bound to have all seen, uh, grey mould botrytis cinerea. Um, that usually comes in on wounded tissue. You get the, uh, brown blotches, and then once the tissue starts to be sort of digested, you get the masses of grey spores, and they're so easy to um, spread. You know, it's very difficult in propagation. If you get, if you just touch one of these, touch a plant with it, just to sort of take it away, then you really need to make sure you wash your hands because your hands will be covered with um, spores and you'll just touch onto something else and that, that'll spread. So um, that needs to be um, carefully disposed of. When you dispose of the plants, you know, don't waft them around, just put the bag or whatever it is, uh, or the flamethrower right against them so that they're destroyed without moving the spores around. Um, that's favoured by cold, um, sort of uh, cooler conditions, moist and wet, said by damaged tissue, um, there will be a sclerotia which can stay in the soil for a while or wherever you're growing it. And um, they then can produce spores from those sclerotia. And there's a huge range of uh, crop hosts. So um, it's virtually ubiquitous, but the control measures will be to handle the transplants carefully. Try not to injure them when you're weeding because that will allow um, facilitate entry. Again, the drainage, um, make sure it's good. Avoid planting your plants deep. And there are some uh, products, some biological products, Amylox, Serenade, ASO, and Prestrop that you can put on, actually onto the foliage to um, to stop the spread to, where you put it on the ones that weren't affected to stop the spread from any that you have already roped out that are infected. So sort of looking now finally at um, the fungicides in IPM. So always some of you may have seen like the triangle where you've got the pesticides at the top and cultural controls at the bottom you find you sort of work your way up them for the the different um if things one thing's the cultural don't work then you don't go straight to fungicides you consider other other methods so they're your first line if you are using fungicides they're pretty much all protectant so they're not going to do much good um once you've got the disease certainly on the on the plant that's affected It'll protect the ones that uh, next to it that haven't got the disease. A lot of them are extensions of authorization for minor use, which means they they haven't always had efficacy tests and they probably haven't been tested on your particular crop. So they use they use them at your risk. Um, they haven't been uh, fully tested. Often it's the HDB have done some testing, so they got some evidence to get the the AMU, but. It's not across the, the wider ranges, the, the full label. If you're doing organics, you can use biofungicides, but check with your people that you're you're working with that, that, that they accept them. Um, there are some chemical fungicides available, particularly for rhizoctonia, sclerotinia, downy mildew, and botrytis. Um, and if you do use them, um, you need to make sure you alternate the different modes of action because you can get resistance building up to those fungicides. If you are going to put a, a product on, make sure that you um, don't sort of use it with gay abandon. It really just is needed if you've got uh, humid conditions, say, uh, and you're likely to have the spores present. If you're scrupulously clean and you're keeping your tunnels ventilated, then you shouldn't have, um, you shouldn't really be needing them. Um, there's also drenches you can use pre-sowing for some of the diseases I mentioned. Uh, but a lot of them will actually need to be um, have reapplications um, for the actual foliar sprays and, and be aware of your harvest intervals as well. So for your chemicals uh, and your biologicals, there are these websites that provide information. The If you can afford the UK pesticide guide, that's the best thing really for if you're looking up for the 
particular products that are there for your particular crops that gives the, the off labels the mus and the the label things um the crd just tells you what um crop and you don't often know what disease or pest it's actually for uh, and there's actually a very good um guidance notes from era on ipm that i've put uh, uh, information there so we've got the the cycle that we looked at, at the beginning the main thing now is to think that um, you've done your observations, so we need to look at when you get to the end of the season, uh, you need to sort of have a look at your observations and see how you're going to plan your, your next cropping cycle. So uh, crop monitoring is an important part of IPM. You need to make sure that you're recording any disease problems, the dates and the conditions in which they appeared. And if you have used control measures, how effective have they been? And was there some varieties that uh, were better uh, staying staying alive or remained healthier? Because you need to remember um, that those are the good ones. And similarly, those were didn't 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 work out well. Uh, don't come put those in again just because you've got the seed packet there. Um, were there disease hotspots? And if if there were, consider why they were. And to learn from problems, don't repeat mistakes. And have a plan for your rotation. So know if you can rotate. Um, and you are going to still go in the soil, make sure you know what you're coming to next with your less chance of getting um, a disease. So I said it's easy as one, two, three, four, five. You've got those the different steps of IPM. So hopefully you'll, you'll understand that. And these are some guides that are provided by the HDB. Um, there's one on lettuce crops there and lettuce and celery crop waters guide, which you may have already, but if you haven't, it's worth, you can download those from the website for, for free. Okay, so it was a bit of a gallop. <laughs> Has anybody got any uh, questions or things they'd like to say where they've had issues? Did I help you in any way, Chris? Because I don't know. I sort of felt to you know that you know I wasn't sure we would still be here at the end. Because <laughs> yeah, it really was. Yeah, um, certainly going to look into the the pre-stop. I think that probably sort of covers a few of the things I do struggle with. So yeah, yeah. it's it's you know I know we're not we're hydroponic, but we do use you know a, a coir and peat based plug. So there is a yeah. soil involved with it. But yeah. yeah, certainly it's not completely pest and disease free. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think with the with the biologicals, the, like the pre-stop, you do need to get a good coverage. So that that's that is an issue more so than because some chemicals are actually systemic, aren't they? Whereas the pre-stops and serenades, they they do literally need to coat them. So that does need to be um, a consideration. And also look at the regulations on on the, on the labels of when they say to apply. Some of them, I know, for example, AQ10, which isn't actually on the one that this you can use, but it does say you know ply in the evening uh, and that sort of thing because they are they you know uv isn't isn't good for them um so it does need a bit of uh, thought when to actually apply them i think sophie you were saying that when we before we started off that you you do you grow on was it sort of ridges or so we've got raised beds. We've got like two, um, a polytunnel and a greenhouse, and they've both got a sort of gravel drained base. So it, we, we're not completely, like we're not on concrete or anything. So it's slightly more advanced and container growing, but but they, they, then we've then raised the beds about a foot off the ground. Um, yeah, I haven't used any kind of uh, fungicide or bio control at all. So I only use um, the power of people, really, mm. and, and changing our watering system, that massively helped us. So when we went from normal watering with a rose to this drip feed watering system, that massively reduced the disease that we had. Because with leafy salads, it seems to be that the, the water on the leaves and the splash back, as you were talking about, that's a massive way that disease was being promoted in our crops. Um, also for me I have we've got a very small space I have an inclination to pack everything in really close and you can often get a bigger crop from things that are 
are not packed in so close and then we'll not get disease and the crop will grow bigger and so I am always trying to squeeze in a few more here and there and actually it's not always to my benefit I've learned to just like mm. step back and be like well, we'll just plant less and actually we'll get a better crop out of out of planting less mm. do you have sort of um all your do you have a mix mix crops at all in any way or so we have we've got about 16 varieties of salad and they are in different groups so we have lettuce and we have mustards and rockets so we have sort of a broad brassica group and then we have like um baby chard and some spinach and um wow i'm doing something extraordinary in alison's window <laughs> i'm like flashing backwards and forwards oh, that's funny isn't it um so yeah, so I try and do a rotation, but it's nowhere near a five year rotation. I would mm. be really great if I did a one year rotation because obviously I'm taking things out and putting them in maybe every um, eight to 12 weeks. So um, I am rotating. And the only thing I've had a real problem with is this white mold, which is not quite the same as the picture you put up because it's very circular, but it's on the underleaf. Um, and I've just discovered that yeah, we need to harvest it well. We need to keep the plants really clean so we don't leave any leaves on the surface at all. Mm. Um, and we definitely don't water the leaves of those plants. And then those mustards seem to stay really good, except in those sort of very wet, cold autumn, winter months when it's the trickiest time, really. And I'd plant less mustards then and more of the other, other things that are more resistant at that time. So yeah, sort of choosing varieties that are resistant to disease as mm. well. Do people look at varieties? I mean, I'm not sure if there's a particular... The trouble is people often like want one particular variety because they've always had it. And I don't know how much you actually look at catalogues and look at new varieties and things. I'm really lucky because I sell a mixed bag of salad and I tell people they get what they get in their salad. <laughs> and as long as it's a mixture, then it's OK. Like I see if you're trying to grow one particular, I'd be interested if the other... People here are trying to grow one specific variety because their customers require that. Because um, I feel like I've let myself off the hook there. I'm in the same boat as you. I just said it's a mixed bag of lattice and they get what they're given. Some red and some green. <laughs> some I think, flat, I think some as there's some different flavours in there, different textures, colours, then, you know, people are quite happy with a salad bag. Yeah, yeah. I've had sort of chefs asking for particular varieties sometimes and say it's just, it's not my system, it's not what I do. I'm doing 100 kilo a week sometimes I can't sort of deviate from, from the way I do it um and yeah so sort of and we just we find which varieties work in our system because it's the hydroponics some varieties don't turn out like they look in the magazine they go a bit mutant <laughs> they don't deal with it um so we do struggle to find the right variety sometimes and then it, it changes through the season as well which one's grow at each end of the year sort of thing which ones deal with the autumn which ones deal with the summer yeah. and uh, especially this time of year it's you know it's it's been 31 degrees inside the polytunnel today and then it'll be three or four tonight <laughs> it's uh, makes it quite difficult sometimes yeah uh, erica said about the dream of having this like a uh, automated polytunnel and i thought i've got one of those it's called my feet like <laughs> run out there and open it up with the sides up and open the doors and yeah. <laughs> oh, I run back and I shut it and I don't I'm not actually on my site so I have to make some really horrible decisions of now I'm going to keep it shut and it's going to get too hot or now I'm going to leave it open and it's going to get too cold and they're always really hard ones to call mm. I've had that problem for years because we don't live on site but um I've made all the window frames now and bought automatic openers the same as you have in glass houses and oh. they're really cheap they were like 20 quid i got extra strong ones because they were big wooden windows i was putting in um but it's a job waiting to happen but ultimately i will have self-opening windows and when it gets hot it will just release the excess heat um because if you're not there every day like you say it's 30 degrees and then it's minus three at night so you can't you know, and I might be going off to teach at seven in the morning and I have to choose then whether or not to open open it up. So um, hopefully uh, I'll let you know how I get on, but it should be automated by the summer. 
Well done, like, that's something impressive. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. As far as varieties go, I, I do always look at the catalogues and look at varieties. I just find the modern lettuce varieties are so expensive and you get so few in a pack. Um, I just don't bother with them. I've tried a few and I haven't found they're as great as the packets say they're going to be. Um, I found the best way is to save my own lettuce seed, which is suited to our soil and our climate. And, um, and you get masses of it for nothing. Um, and I've found that a much better result than buying in expensive hybrids that are supposed to be resistant to everything. Yeah, I, I agree, actually, Emma. I've tried to buy like 200 special lettuce seeds and ended up thinking, you know, my organic green salad bowl from little Welsh supplier is a much better seed than mm. buying something else. So, I yeah. Uh, Uh, Alison, were you trying to talk? I can. Yeah, I was just going to say, I can see Alison trying to speak, but um, we can't seem to hear you. Ah. Might need to fiddle with the settings or pop something in the chat. I, it was also interesting listening to you, Erica, because I've never disinfected anything in my life. Mm. And I was like, I've never done that. I do clean things. Yeah. And I actually, no, that was a complete lie. We're packing salad. We disinfect our packing area. Yeah. But it was when I think of propagating. I've never disinfected a propagation tray. Oh. I do disinfect my, um, you know, my packing area, my uh, yes. weighing scales, my knives, all of that. So I just... Thought. I shouldn't say I've never. I think you've been. I think you might have been lucky. <laughs> but, well, we. I just clean out the trays. They're stored outside through the winter, I guess, so they get very cold. That won't my, no, no. And I've never. That's in like fifteen years. Mm. I've never had any. Any. I, I don't. I don't disinfect mine either, Sophie. You're not alone there. Yeah. And I, I go with the same thinking. They're outside, getting minus ten. That's going to kill off quite a lot. And then I move them inside so they get baked in the greenhouse, mm. and that was going to kill off a load of stuff as well. Yeah, I think the inside is is probably a good idea. I think I mean some of the the um well a fair number of the of fungi when we we actually keep them in the freezer, um to actually bring out to inoculate plants. So fungi don't care about freezing. Um, so that is otherwise we probably wouldn't ever have any diseases you know they'd all die and die in our usual you know previous winters um but solarization is is one way of, of doing it can get quite hot can't it in a in a tunnel if you put a put a um shut things in there um and that is one of the methods you know quite often in the continent they're using for their for their soil treatment but we just you well in the past we haven't been hot enough to do that A lot of the moulds and fungus are reliant on water, though, aren't they? So if you've brought your tray into the greenhouse and the tray's dry, would that not have killed off a lot of the, like, mm. boitritis and stuff before you... It would, it would kill off the, um, the, um, the sort of the, the spores that are produced daily, but the resting spores, so you've got the ewe spores in the Pythium, you've got the sclerotia in the Rhizoctonia and the sclerotinia, uh, chlamydia spores in Fusarium. They don't they don't care about being dried. I mean, one way we keep um, fusarium cultures is by drying off the chlamydia spores in talcum powder or sand. And then you just sort of shake the culture on a Petri dish with agar and they, it grows like, you know, as if it it was, you know, doesn't doesn't care. And I've had those tubes for like five years and they don't they don't care. They like being dry. Um, so certainly if you've got anything that's sort of debris that's attached, that that will then. Uh, you know, if it has has mycelium on that could then form sclerotia or other resting spores. So I would say dry dry isn't necessarily going to be saving you. So it's, it's interesting. Alison's saying she's making the mixed salad bags like the others and find her own your own uh, the, your own seeds that you've collected are more resilient, but also you grow lettuce for 
particular seasons, winter lettuces now, summer lettuces later on. That's interesting that your seeds that you're collecting are more resistant to the to the um, the diseases that maybe are more particular to your area. Yeah, I think you have to be careful with um, self-saved seeds. As you know, I've got these uh, sort of things, all the viruses that can be carried by the seeds. So you know, you're probably sensible that you need to collect them from plants that are you know healthy and not and not, and not wait till they're healing over with something or other but um you know the, the, obviously the commercial growers they do do seed testing they they often treat the seeds because of their seed borne diseases um so you know it's it's a potential thing and and i think if you uh, don't dry them you know don't dry them properly you could actually get botrytis on and that sort of thing so um but you sound like you're all doing okay <laughs> i don't know i'm quite interested by this sort of idea because all my sort of organic growing has been about trying to keep the soil and the landscape as alive as possible mm. and so this idea of sort of completely drenching or completely um heat treating or anything like that to the soil has sort of been counterintuitive to what I have sort of spent my time doing mm. and, and it seems like it's been okay but I haven't grown five acres of one crop I've only ever grown small beds of one crop and then small beds of another crop. So you've got that leeway where diseases can't wipe through a whole field. Mm. So that sort of is some security itself, isn't it? Just having yeah. the crop varieties there. Yeah. I think the soil treatment issue is is, I mean, we you know, we had chloropicrol metam sodium and, and that sort of thing, and now that, that's not available. So um I think the, the main thing is making sure the disease doesn't get in there. And, and there was always the issue that if you did uh, steam sterilize or, um, you know, basically make a, a soil, no, no microbes in it, then the, if you did get the bad guy microbes in, they, they could then swamp over because there was nothing in there to compete with them. Um, so that, that that can be a, an issue. And that, there has been suggestions that if you do totally sterilize soil, then you perhaps put some of these other products on to actually re-establish what you've, you know, the 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 balance, the good balance that you you've had to destroy at the same time. So that yeah, I think there's a lot of things that we're learning, and and uh, you know, we we for the bioprotectant products, we're trying to learn how to use them and how they actually work. And uh, I said there is now molecular techniques to be able to look and see what's going on a lot better than before, where you had to culture and some things wouldn't culture and that sort of thing. So. I think there'd be a lot more information coming out on sort of balancing microbes um, in the next few years. Do you have any top tips on dealing with aphids? Because they're my biggest issue, really. And then they, they also bring in the disease as well or mm. we'll spread it throughout it. So, yeah, yeah I mean, so the... we're just using aphicide and we're pretty reliant on it, really. I'd like to sort yeah. of move away from it. Um, you can buy the um, parasitoids, can't you? You can buy it. Certainly, I've worked in strawberries and they have um, various uh, little wasps that you get in little test tubes. Yeah, the trouble is, is, is uh, you know, it's anything sort of critter that's on the leaf is is something that's on the leaf and I'm picking it and packing yes. it. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> so, buying it, critters yeah. to eat the other critters, yeah, yeah. it's still a critter on the leaf. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they really yeah. work though. I've mm. used them and then I don't have whatever the other things are. I've never seen the other things again. Yeah. You like release yeah. them, but I haven't seen loads of the other thing. I can't yeah. remember what they're called. They have these Latin names that I just can't yeah. remember. What. <laughs> like, like, and yeah, I would try them. Be very useful. Yeah, I have tried them in the past, but I just, I don't know. Do they, <laughs> do they stick around? Do they hang around? Or do they go off and find something outside? <laughs> do they stay in the polytunnel or? I think they should be all right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, certainly yeah. uh, Jude Benison's within our um, entomology group and she's, you know, been one of the first people to sort of start working on that, promoting it. And we don't, in our polytunnels at, at Boxworth, we just use the the um, parasites, par parasites um, mm. in there uh, and that's, that's fine. Um, you do have to keep reapplying them. You can't just expect yeah. them to sort yeah. of get on with it. Um, but Yes, I think that's more the case that growers are just using those. They're not using the sprays. Mm. Mm. Might be worth another bash. <laughs> I also also always think that my aphids come when the plants are on and not happy. Yeah, yeah. If they're stressed, if there's, if there's, yeah, 
dying plants or decaying plants and yeah yeah or just that. too hot if i've let it get too hot and then they've been sort of stressed by a period of of too too much heat or i've let it get too dry or some sort of thing that's happened to the plants so i feel like oh that's they've been compromised yeah, that way yeah. just yeah. when you're struggling with something else they come and kick you as well <laughs> yeah right yeah. I think in hydroponics, they're particularly prone to aphids, aren't they? Because you're growing very, very soft, delicate leaves. Yes, they're, they're tender, they're lots very nice. Of nitrogen, completely lots of protected nitrogen, environment. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's nice yeah, and protected. So the for aphids them. just. There might be a new sort of uh, food product, aphid, <laughs> aphid <laughs> protein or something. High protein and salad. <laughs> They taste really... all right, don't they? I mean, you know. There's a, a, another comment in the chat from Alison that ladybirds and is it hoverflies are good, and she also grows marigolds around the polytunnel. Yeah, I played about with some companion planting, sort of want to try a lot of alliums and stuff as well, and sort of strong smelling stuff. They like different things throughout the season. Yeah, um, I've got loads of um, lacewing boxes and things like that as well, just sort of generally encourage everything else outside in the surrounding area to reduce the aphid population altogether. Yeah. So what, Chris, I'm interested, you're growing hydroponically, but you're not, the only hydroponic place I've been in is almost like a sealed unit, as it were. It yeah. sounds like yours is more open. It's, it's basically just a polytunnel, yeah. Uh, so okay. three, three polytunnels. Okay. Um, with, the, with, yeah, benches in, the hydroponic benches in them. Uh, um, so yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's what I tend to do is sort of take various different systems and pick what works for us and and cobble it together ourselves. But yeah, we are just looking into doing a fully indoor farm as well for for herbs like basil and, and parsley and so on. Um, and some small amount of micro herbs, but there's everybody does micro herbs around here. Um, so it's a bit flooded that market really. Um, but yeah, it's just polytunnels, so sort of they've got net sides on them for when it's hot in the summer, or wind the sides up, it's got net sides, but yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, so it's easy for aphids to come flying in. Yeah, yeah, there's no stopping them. <laughs> Are there any other questions, Farika or Sophie? If not, um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you both for um, for this afternoon's webinar and thank you everybody else for attending. And if um, you do think of any further questions or you need any support in other way, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Um...